according to the indictment, Menendez uh, wanted this guy to be named U.S. Attorney because he thought that he would go easy on a buddy of of Menendez who was in some legal trouble. And then secondly, some stuff involving Menendez's meetings and actions concerning foreign aid to uh, to Egypt. It's the Lawfare Podcast. I'm Quinta Jurassic, Senior Editor, with my fellow Lawfare Senior Editor Molly Reynolds, along with Dan Richman of Columbia Law School and Eric Columbus, who previously served as Special Litigation Counsel at the U.S. House of Representatives Office of General Counsel. I think the government's done a, a very nice job of, on the facts here, teasing out how a number of the things that Menendez did arguably are not legislative acts, um, are something far short of it. Today, we're talking about the ongoing corruption trial of New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez. Dan and Eric, thank you so much for joining us to talk about the only prosecution, at least that I know of, that both involves a sitting senator and literal gold bars. Um, To begin with, I think it would be useful to just have a brief overview of what exactly it is that Senator Menendez has been accused of. I don't know which one of you would like to jump in. I could start, although, you know, as I mentioned to, to Quinta before we went on, Lawfare has, has set the gold standard for trial coverage, and and I worry that I'm not exactly up to its standards on, on, on factual recitations. But but essentially, there's a, a broad conspiracy charge, and, and out of it are, are brought some sub-conspiracies and substantive accounts that essentially have Senator Menendez with his wife receiving substantial amounts of money and and or gold bars and or cars for doing a variety of of favors or asks for the Egyptian government for for people um connected to the government and for um associates of theirs both with respect to to doing things um in Menendez's straightforward senatorial capacity and his intervening in uh, investigations being pursued by, in one case, the state attorney general, and in the other case, the U.S. attorney's office. So, Dan, you and Quinta actually recorded a podcast on this case back in the fall of 2023, low so many months ago, um, after Menendez was first indicted. Um, and one of the main issues that you and Quinta talked about then um, had to do with the difficulty of prosecuting corruption cases under the precedent in McDonald versus the United States, which is a 2016 Supreme Court decision. Dan, can you talk a little bit about what the court ruled in McDonnell and why is it relevant to the Menendez case? So in McDonald, the court did a number of things. First, it built on existing precedents to really hammer home how when bribery is charged, and in that case, the bribery charges were under the Hobbs Act and the color of law theory and the wire fraud on a services theory. But essentially, the court, when addressing bribery definitions, took the what it read as the requirements from the federal bribery statute of 201 and now that I will get to the heart of it, said, yes, there definitely has to be a quid pro quo with respect to the acceptance of payments by a public official. But more importantly, and this is where McDonald pushed forward, the quid pro quo had to be with respect to very particular things, official acts being the term of art. It's not enough that a public official took money to merely set up a meeting or make some phone calls. What we're looking for is some truly official decision or other sort of act that is with respect to something of substance. So that was the big move in McDonald. And of course, with every big move the court makes, it leaves open a ton of questions. And in particular, McDonald leaves open 
a ton of questions about how it works in the real world. In the real world, and particularly we see it in the Menendez case, heavy-hitting public officials of, of the sort that Menendez is have the ability to get things done in other than formal legislative or executive ways. They put pressure on other people on other people who aren't necessarily their hierarchical subordinates, but but people who don't just respect the office, but have a good and well-educated sense that the senator can hurt them if they don't do what he asks. So the question is, when you make put pressure on people to do things, and you do it through a phone call, and you do it through a meeting, does that count? To what extent does the official act of that other person provide the official act necessary for a bribery charge? And the court in McDonald said, yeah, I think so. Um, And they have some nice dicta opening the way for theories of pressure. But as is their want, the court gave very little help to lower courts and prosecutors as to how exactly that works. A little pressure, is that enough? What about nice a, a nice ask? These are all things that are both important in working out the doctrine and are going to be really important in, in the jury's approach to the instructions they get in this case and to any issues on appeal should he be convicted. So prosecutors are grappling not only with the sort of the legacy of McDonnell, but also with the very specific problems that result from trying to prosecute a member of Congress. Um, And by that, of course, I'm referring to the speech or debate clause. So Eric, I want to turn this one over to you. Can you explain what speech or debate immunity is and how it relates to this case? Yes. The speech or debate clause of the Constitution says that Quote, for any speech or debate in either house, they, and they refers to senators and representatives, shall not be questioned in any other place. Uh, The Supreme Court has read that uh, expansively uh, in order to fulfill uh, the clause's purposes. The the purpose of the clause basically is to protect Congress from being harassed, attacked, impeded in its ability to do its job by the executive branch and the judicial branch. Uh, and it, it protects uh, not just literal speech and debate within uh, Congress, but also acts such as uh, voting or issuance of subpoenas, uh, committee reports, uh, conduct at hearings. Uh, for example, it's impossible to directly challenge a subpoena that's been issued to you which is something that, that uh, some people uh, often don't know about. Uh, even uh, a uh, one James Comey discovered uh, to his chagrin when he tried to sue a House committee uh, that issued him a support. I was a lawyer on that case, and yes, it was an uphill and losing battle. <laughs> so in, in this case, there, there's basically been a trio of, of – of Supreme Court cases from the late 60s to the mid 1970s, trying to sort out how the speech or debate clause comes into play where members of Congress are indicted. The first one was a case called United States v. Johnson in 1966, where a former congressman uh, convicted of violating the conflict of interest statute and conspiring to defraud United States. Uh, he was allegedly involved in a scheme to attempt to influence DOJ to dismiss a pending mail fraud indictment against against the bank. And part of the conspiracy, he was allegedly paid to give a speech favorable to the banks. And at trial, they the government showed that the speech was prepared to help was prepared solely to help private interests, and it wasn't prepared the normal way. And they they literally questioned him about about his speech. In, in in the trial, and uh, somehow this this went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and you would think it would be somewhat obvious that they shall not be questioned in either house. They shall not be questioned in any other place. Means that you cannot 
cross-examine a member of Congress about his own uh, speech, his own literal speech. And the Supreme Court said, no, you cannot do that. Literal violation of the speech debate clause. A few years later, a case, uh, United States v. Brewster, involving a senator from Maryland named Daniel Brewster, one of his former interns became House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Uh, another one was, uh, at the same time, I believe, was uh, Staney Hoyer, who became a majority leader under Speaker Pelosi. And he was indicted for bribery. And the basic question was, can you indict a senator for for bribery? And the Supreme Court said yes. Maybe somewhat surprisingly, three justices said no. Uh, Justice Brennan, Justice White, and Justice Douglas. And the, 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 the Brewster Court drew a distinction that will be kind of important down the line. The court said, yes, you can indict for, for bribery and try a former member for bribery because the illegal conduct is, is not the legislative act performed by the senator, but rather the promise to perform a legislative act. So you violate the statute when you agree to take the bribe. And when you, or, or when you get the money, it's not when you cast the vote in favor of the interests of the person who bribed you. So in that sense, they did not need to look at any legislative act by Senator Brewster in order to indict him and to prove the case. The third case and the one that was most directly relevant here is a case called uh, Helstosky, in which the Supreme Court faced then, as now, uh, with an allegedly corrupt congressman from New Jersey. I, I know it's a surprise to see this happen more than once. Our state is, we're, we're doing our part. I speak for all New Jerseyans. <laughs> Was he's been tried for accepting money in return for promising to introduce and and actually introducing certain certain bills, and the question was that at trial, the judge said that the rule of the government cannot be allowed to offer any evidence of the actual performance of any legislative acts, and the government appealed that before the trial. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, that's right, actually. Uh, as we said in Brewster, promises to by a member to perform an act in the future are not legislative acts. But you can't refer to a past legislative act without undermining the values protected by the speech or debate clause. So that sets up what's happening in the Menendez case. Now, there are these two sets of issues. Some speech or debate issues in the Menendez case were resolved on uh, a motion to dismiss, and some issues are being fought over now. Yeah. So actually, so let's let's take it, you know, chronologically. What happened at the motion to dismiss stage, um, and then once we have we sort of have a sense of the picture, uh, then we can go on to the evidentiary rulings that are snarling prosecutors up now. Yeah. So at the motion to dismiss, Menendez's lawyers went in and said, look, judge, there are a couple of issues here that you got to kick from the case. Uh, one is this, this business in the indictment about Menendez recommending to President Biden a candidate for a U.S. attorney for the District of New Jersey, who under the indictment, according to the indictment, Menendez uh, wanted this guy to be named U.S. Attorney because he thought that he would go easy on a buddy of of Menendez who was in some legal trouble. And then secondly, some stuff involving Menendez's meetings and actions concerning foreign aid to uh, to Egypt. And the court did not agree and declined to limit the indictment to kick out those uh, those charges. It's kind of interesting. On the first issue, the Constitution, as everyone knows, 
maybe not everyone, uh, says that the president shall nominate and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint officers of the United States, including U.S. attorneys. Now, the question is, advice, does that mean that Menendez trying to lobby uh, the president to pick a certain person, is that part of the advice and consent of the Senate? The court said no. It, it comes after, both in, in that sentence and, and chronologically and logically. The president nominates, and then the senator's role kicks in. When uh, the senator is just doing stuff beforehand, he's basically just trying to uh, lobby uh, the president like anyone else is. And so that was not considered to be part of the, of the – of not – protected by the speech debate clause and was and was not excluded from the indictment. There's actually can, one one point here about about this US attorney's bit. Uh, Dan, I want to pull you in here zooming forward in time to uh, the trial as it's ongoing so that that person who Menendez reached out to is now in fact the US attorney for the District of New Jersey, uh, which I think may answer a question that Dan and I had been asking in the fall about why is this case not being prosecuted um, in uh, New Jersey and why is it being prosecuted in the Southern District of New York. But one of the interesting things is that uh, according to the New York Times, Selinger, the US attorney actually you know, was on the stand, was questioned about this interaction with Menendez and testified essentially that what happened is that Menendez said, you know, reached out to him and said, if you were picked to be U.S. attorney, you know, maybe you could help me with this. And uh, Selinger called him back the next day and said, well, if I'm appointed to U.S. attorney, I will need to recuse myself from this issue, uh, which according to the Times, Selinger then testified essentially ended their friendship. So Dan, from a kind of, you know, DOJ perspective, it struck me that, you know, Selinger is being put in a bit of an awkward position there, but it seems like he handled it relatively well. That's kind of what you'd want to see. Yeah. Um, the general idea is telling the truth is what one needs to do. And it sounds like that he gave a narrative that both makes sense. And from a very distant perspective, since I don't know the facts, sounds quite plausible. But it also highlights the 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 double edged sword of this speech and debate clause issue because it is hard when prosecutors need to prove a quid pro quo that is with respect to some mm. legislative deliverable and they can't prove up whether or not it was delivered. Um, there's there's that missing piece of the story that that jurors are always wanting to hear. And that sounds odd for being excluded. On the other hand, as we see in this U.S. attorney episode, you know, the delivery often isn't a real delivery. What happened with respect to in the U.S. attorney's office, at least the way the testimony has come in, is that Menendez made a a very... A oblique ask without even referencing a particular case, talking about unfairness to um, Latina in, with regard to these fraud prosecutions. And you could easily say to the extent that the, the, the offense turns on proving whether or not he went forward and did what he promised. Well, he didn't really, um, at least not, not very forcefully. But here, but in this case, the government can come back and say, yeah, but the key is what he promised to do and what Yareeb thought he was doing, which was deliver some sort of relief. And the fact that he actually didn't really do much in the way of pushing is really besides the point. So this deliverable or delivery or non-delivery is to some extent a bit of a red herring, both when it hurts the government and when it helps the government. We're going to come back to this sort of double-edged sword tension between the kind of official acts, speech or debate issue in a second. But first, I want to go back to Eric and make sure we finish talking about the way, particularly in this series of evidentiary rulings, the speech or debate issues have been playing out in the case and the challenges that they've been creating for prosecutors. Sure. Uh, do you want me to wrap up with the second issue on in the uh Motion to dismiss or or no? 
Sure. So then on the, on the, the, the second issue about Egypt, it turns out that senators can place holds on the delivery of foreign aid. Uh, this is part of this informal practice that the State Department recognizes, even though they, they have no legal ability to do this. The district court said that that is enough for to constitute a real legislative act. And in, in, in so doing, they, they quoted in passing a, a Third Circuit decision from 2016, um, happens to be titled United States v. Menendez, and just happens to be from the senator's earlier uh, prosecution on, on corruption charges. If you live long enough, things begin to repeat themselves, uh, and it only sometimes takes only eight years. The judge eventually ruled that this was not, in fact, something that needed to be excluded or the indictment needed to be dismissed upon uh, based on speech or debate immunity because this involved only promises to take official acts and did not involve any evidence of the act itself, a distinction that becomes crucial now as we turn uh, to the current battles over introduction of evidence. Now, um, there have been a bunch of squabbles between uh, the judge, or rather between the parties, or the introduction of certain evidence uh, that this has led to reports in, in, in the Times and in, in, in Politico. And these are actually, these appear to be little pieces of evidence that were, are in the indictment itself but doesn't mean that they can necessarily be introduced into evidence. So for, for example, there is one text message that Menendez's wife sent one of the co-conspirators uh, with a link to an article about that she received from Menendez about pending military sales. And she wrote, Bob had to sign off on this. Now, Menendez says that this is evidence of an official act and a legislative act, and you can't introduce that in, into the trial. And the judge agreed. And citing the Helstowski case, the, what the government says, by contrast, is that this is... Um, actually a uh, different from Helstowski because it's a third party talking about this. It is uh, not the senator and that what the government is not trying to in introduce it for evidence is not trying to introduce it to show that there is a legislative act going on, but rather to show the, the mental states and the understandings of the co-conspirators. And as I think Menendez correctly notes, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter for the purposes of the reasons why we have a speech or debate clause and why it is used to limit the introduction of evidence. The government, in, in response to the judge's ruling, sounded, I don't know if hurt is the right word, but they suggest at one point that it is it is difficult to see how any gratuity charge could ever be proven if Menendez were correct that such evidence is barred, which is, is, is rather strong language and somewhat surprising thing to say, actually, to a judge who, is, who has just ruled against you. And uh, when, you're, when you're asking for reconsideration, which is something you, you're very rarely likely to get. Thanks, Eric. And I think this gets at, for me, one of the central bigger picture questions of this case, which is if we take the speech or debate restrictions that you've just laid out, Eric, and we combine them with what Dan has told us about McDonnell, it really seems that prosecutors are in a bind here. There's a tension where prosecutors can't talk about legislative acts but the things that they can talk about might not actually rise to the level of official acts under McDonald. And so I'm just curious, and Dan, maybe we'll start with you, kind of what does this mean for our ability to use criminal prosecution to hold members accountable? 
and we can talk about sort of what other avenues we have, but does this really restrict these two things taken together, really restrict what prosecutors can do to try to hold someone like Menendez accountable for what he's accused of doing? Yeah, the defense papers and, and their strategy, their legal strategy is is reliant, as you suggest, on this kind of cute syllogism that, you know, anything that Menendez does in his legislative capacity is is covered by speech and debate. And if it's but it's only things that he does in his legislative capacity that counts as official acts under McDonald's. So therefore, prosecutions are impossible. That's not quite right. Um, I think the government's done a, a very nice job of, on the facts here, teasing out how a number of the things that Menendez did arguably are not legislative acts, um, are something far short of it. You know, the, the, the effort to, the upfront effort to, to steer the administration to pick a particular U.S. attorney the effort to um, intervene with what was happening in the AG's office. These are, you know, to my mind, less troubling than the national security risks when a senator um, sells his <laughs> sells his offices to a foreign power, but they work a whole lot better in, in creating some daylight between these two, um, the Legislative Act definitions that that um, Menendez is focused on. One thing, though, that, that you know, that's not to say that, that there's nothing to his point. I, I think, as, as Eric was suggesting, there, there's quite a lot of substantial, important evidence that does get excluded via the speech and debate clause. Now, that's not a problem if you're using undercovers and wire everyone up um, as they did an ad scam and get these commitments to do particular things on the record. That's all lovely because, you know, as Brewster makes clear, commitments to do things um, on, even on the floor of the House can still be prosecuted um, without offending the speech and debate clause. The problem is undercover operations of that sort are rare. And we're generally dealing with these retrospective cases involving some mix of cooperators who have credibility issues by definition and circumstantial evidence. And to the extent you're making out a case of of a corrupt transaction based on circumstantial evidence, the inability to show delivery on the floor of the House or in some official act really does take a real hit on the government's case. The hit is hard to measure in the sense that if the jury were told up front, hey, one thing you can't hear about is delivery. You're not to speculate on it, just put it out of your mind, etc. I'm not sure the problem would be so significant because because jurors happen to be kind of like us and they'd figure it out. Uh, uh, but it's that's not the way it works, and it leaves a a real uphill slog for the government in proving up corrupt deals that involve clear deliveries in the form of of legislative acts where you're where you don't have an undercover or where you don't have fantastic emails or tapes or something of that sort. Thanks, Eric. Anything to add on this question of sort of how these two, the speech or debate clause and the uh, principles of McDonald sort of interact to make it hard to hold members accountable? First, I wanted to ask Dan actually about something he just said about how about informing the jury and how the jury is not informed that that they won't hear anything about delivery. I mean, why can't that be done either at the beginning or, or in the jury charge at the very least? say that explaining the elements in a way that makes clear that delivery is not needed to be proved. Fair point. And I'd be happy to be wrong in thinking that such a charge won't be given. And I certainly haven't seen the government's request to charge here or any supplementary requests they've made. I'd be a little surprised if were they to ask that they'd get it just because of 
the risks that, as I was suggesting before, maybe that would be deemed as a constitutional matter too cute by half in the sense that if you if you told jurors not to speculate about it, they might. And to the extent they did speculate on it and weren't really precluded and we couldn't trust that instruction from keeping them from doing so, then we would have the constitutional issue for all the for all the um, reasons you gave. So it's worth thinking about, but I'd be surprised if it was really considered a an adequate solution to the problem. Mm-hmm. The official, I mean, it's interesting the distinction between the the official act issue and the speech or debate clause issue. One of them, one of those issues, could be resolved by Congress at any time. Uh, there's no obstacle to Congress overturning the the McDonald decision or doing something that pairs it back. And now you might, <laughs> a cynical person might say that Congress is not going to do anything that will make it easier to, you know, serve up its members to uh, to the Bureau, Federal Bureau of Prisons, and that that could well be right. But you know, in theory, there's no reason why that that can't happen. I guess I, I want to push back a little because it seems that. In its infinite wisdom, the Supreme Court isn't very attentive to the words of Congress in these cases. You know, the official act language we're talking about in reference in McDonald was in a case involving the Hobbs Act and the mail fraud statutes, two statutes that don't in any way mention official act. They, the court decided as part of its project to protect politics as usual to bring in those words from 201. And, you know, in another example, I don't want to predict the future, but I suspect that when Snyder comes down shortly involving um, 666, the federal program bribery statute, it will be the court saying that word reward in the statute that Congress explicitly used doesn't really mean what it what the English language would suggest it means. So, so yes, as a as a theoretical matter, Congress really does have the power. And the, you know, at the core of the court's separation of powers and attack on the administrative state is this this idea that Congress can do whatever it wants when it wants. But it turns out that the court is putting considerable constraints on what Congress can do in. Not exactly a constitutional vision, but in a subconstitutional vision of protecting politics as usual. So you're exactly right. You could change the statute. I'm not sure what words and stars and underlining Congress could do to really make the court shift its position on, on the space it's carving out for politicians to do what politicians do. McDonald was a unanimous decision. Yes, right, indeed. and and as of some of its predecessors leading up to it, so and, and Fisher will definitely not be, uh, which kind of suggests that it's it's not strictly uh, the same division as what we've seen in kind of the campaign finance cases, where we see the court trying to uh, make it harder to limit a certain set of kind of tawdry things that politicians do in the um mcdonald official act arena it, it seems to come from a place of of beyond ideology wouldn't you agree Dan? beyond partisan ideology yes i do think that. yeah oh yes this my criticism is not that they're they're acting partisan my criticism is that they are implementing a vision of what politics should look like in its relationship to criminal law that is not particularly guided by Congress and and isn't, at least so far as they've explained, required by the Constitution. It's more their their ideas of what should be tolerated or at least immunized from prosecution and what shouldn't. Yeah. In the speech or debate clause area, in, interestingly, which, which is obviously part of the Constitution, the Supreme Court has said in actually in each of those three cases, Johnson, Brewster, and Helstowski, they said, look, we're not considering the situation where Congress passes a narrowly drawn statute, basically applying it only to itself, uh, that would allow certain uh you know legislative acts to be used against a member of congress in a criminal proceeding 
And the court at one point, I think, noted some reasons why such a statute might still be problematic because the speech debate clause protects individual members and doesn't necessarily protect only, you know, kind of Congress as a whole. But that it's interesting to note that that is one option uh, that Congress could take a run at trying to to remove these protections. If 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 George Santos, well, I guess George Santos, just all, all of George Santos's conduct precedes his uh, his entry into Congress. But it, it, there's a situation where someone just so distasteful gets off due to the speech or debate clause, and Congress is willing to, you know, in some sense, fall on its sword. Maybe that's the type of thing that could have some value down the road. I don't know. It's funny, Eric, that you introduced George Santos into this discussion. Um, Before we move on, I do want to note that we sort of, in addition to this possibility of criminal prosecution, have the ability of the House and Senate to discipline its own members um, through, uh, through expulsion. It is, I think, at least worth contemplating um, why the Senate has chosen not to expel Bob Menendez, but the House did expel George Santos. It's not a story enti- that you can entirely tell by politics because Santos got expelled and then got replaced by someone of the other party. Um, whereas uh, Menendez, um, if he had been expelled, would have been replaced by an appointed member uh, from a, a governor of his own party. Um, but I do think that sort of the challenges that the current Congress faces in disciplining its own members add an extra layer, I think, of importance to this discussion about where and how the limits of um, criminal prosecution come into play in terms of trying to hold um, hold someone accountable. Yeah, I agree. I- it's also worth noting, though, that Menendez, whatever happens in this trial, Menendez has already been effectively disciplined. Uh, he was disciplined by the uh, voters in the Democratic primary. He didn't even run, right? Is that, I don't remember what happened. He, that's, this that's is another right. question that we'll come to, which is the idea that uh, Menendez got indicted. He elected not to file in the Democratic primary, but has now said that he uh, is collecting signatures to run as an independent on um, on the ballot in November. But you're, I mean, I think it's, it's, a fi- it's a fair point, Eric, that we don't want to sell the voters entirely short here on kind of their role as a accountability mechanism even in situations where both criminal prosecution and probably internal cameral discipline may not deliver the kinds of accountability that might be important. One thing to always think about when you're thinking about alternatives to criminal prosecutions is that, you know, particularly in a case like Menendez, none of the information gathering that occurred in this case, none of the investigation of the sort that one would hope would affect and influence perhaps the Senate or maybe even the voters of New Jersey could have occurred without criminal process and a, a criminal prosecution. So, so the idea that, you know, we have these other mechanisms to use instead of criminal prosecutions, I think is, is sort of illusory in, except to the extent that people commit their corrupt acts. Um, in the open, or we have fantastic local journalism of the sort that's dying out that would bring this, bring activities to light. That's, that, that's, yeah, that's an excellent point in that, that the voters would not have the information upon which to reject Menendez if not for this prosecution. I should also, I should also make the point that just more New Jersey politics that, uh, the governor and the state legislature just pushed through an extremely unpopular law, essentially killing the open records uh, system for public access to state records in New Jersey, which further limits the ability to access, you know, the kind of material you'd want here. Obviously, Menendez is a federal official, but some of the allegations in the indictment do pertain to him attempting to put pressure on the New Jersey attorney general. So to the extent that that is an avenue that is now perhaps also closed off. Yeah, I don't want to be mean, but it was part of the voir dire that the the Southern District of New York um, prospective jurors were asked 
um, whether they thought that um, people from New Jersey were more corrupt or something of that sort. And you know, I'm just saying. It's all very they, and they can't they can't pump their own gas apparently. It's true. They're it's true. I'm so I'm so glad that we we got to the part where we just make fun of New Jersey because that was really that was what I was looking forward to. But I'm surprised in, it took this and long. I'm I'm dead serious about that. By the way, <laughs> I do want to make sure that we touch on. There's a couple other things. The first one has to do with the role of the Foreign Agents Registration Act. So at least as far as Molly and I could tell. Uh, it appears that this is the first time that a sitting member of Congress has been charged in connection with FARA, which requires agents of foreign countries or political parties, so on, to register with the Justice Department if they're trying to influence U.S. policymaking. Menendez is not himself charged with violating FARA, but with violating a companion statute and with conspiracy to violate FARA, um, which might have the beneficial effect to prosecutors of sort of presenting a a lower bar in terms of what they have to prove, um, which is particularly good because the government has had bad luck with FARA cases recently. So I'm I'm curious what both of you make on that, both on, Dan, maybe the sort of aspect of proving these cases, um, and Eric, the way that the Justice Department is attempting to apply FARA perhaps for the first time to a sitting member of Congress. Okay, I want to check, but isn't count 16 a substantive charge, um, 219 charge against Menendez? Count 16 is a, a substantive charge. It's a charge under the companion statute that prevents him as a public official from acting as a foreign agent, period, not just for violating like original FARA for not registering right. his activities. Right. I would think both as a penalty, I would think for cleanliness, 219, you know, charging just a public official for acting as an agent just makes so much more sense than than getting mixed up in, in the niceties of, of the FARA statute per se, you know, from, from Title 22. So I, I think that's, I wouldn't put that down to some proof for or, um, or prudential problem as, as much as just a, a very ability to charge the most straightforward violation in, in a very pointed way. So, so your question, um, um, it does, you know, we're told it's unprecedented. Um, that's certainly what Menendez said. I'm sure if the government could find precedent, it would have responded that, that this wasn't um, unprecedented. So, so yeah, uh, I do think we should, we'll be seeing more 219. Obviously, the um, Representative Quellar has been charged with, with a similar offense. The 219 possibilities sort of came to the attention of of many in the wake of um, Special Counsel Mueller's activities. But even before Mueller was on the scene in 2016, you had representatives from the House pushing the Inspector General's Office of Justice to look into the failure to pursue FARA cases. And a report came out in 2016, even before Mueller was on the scene, saying there really ought to be a comprehensive Justice Department strategy that includes the use of criminal charges in this area. And I think we're seeing the, the fruits of that refocusing on, on the criminal possibilities of, of FARA. And I think, you know, to some extent, it seems a little, it once might have seemed obscure to reach for FARA in a case like this. But the more and more the corruption statutes get twisted in various ways by the Supreme Court, the more I think there's there's an attraction to Farah in a case like this, where you know the, the honest services statute, Hobbs Act, six six six, two hundred one, are all very generic when they're talking about public officials, and very generic in terms of who the corrupt transaction is. Wouldn't it be nice to have perhaps a, a, a special standard because of the grave concerns where you're dealing with a high government official and it's a foreign power? The ability to bring Farah in in conjunction with um, standard bribery charges, I think, allows the government, you could say to some extent, I, I don't want to call it a, a, a safety net because Farah because it hasn't been used very much, isn't can't be considered a safety net since there's a lot more 
doctrinal work to be done, but it really provides some vehicle for the government to say, you know, this case is different. This involves a foreign power trying to, at least as the allegations go, buy a senator. And and that needs to be fully captured in the proof, even as, as Eric has been um, nicely explaining, it, it will run into speech and debate clause issues itself. But I suspect we'll be seeing more of this. And that's really regrettable that the facts are increasingly there to allow the use of it. You know, is it a fair point when you have the arguments, well, this will criminalize all sorts of situations where congressmen act in support of foreign powers? And there's this risk that if they speak in favor, if they do work in favor of a foreign power, they'll be, you know, improperly tagged with being agents of the foreign power. And the answer to that is, you know, criminal cases are complicated. And in every every case where, where somebody is charged with conspiring, there's a possibility that what they was doing what they were doing has nothing to do with coordinated action with others, was independent, and maybe they're innocent. And I think senators should have the ability to try and show that too. But I'm really not worried, at least yet, about the over-prosecution of, of senators in, on the facts in, in, in the Quellar and Menendez cases. Yeah, Eric, anything you'd like to add to that one? The only thing I have to add is that based on its recent efforts, DOJ must be Ryan O'Neill, the way they turn on that Farrah Fawcett. I will show my age and say that when you suggested that joke before we started recording, I did have to Google it. Let me, let me turn. (laughs) Let me, let me ask. I want to close with one more uh, somewhat serious question, which is about the classified information procedures act, the statute that sort of provides for processes for handling classified information um, over the course of the criminal process. Dan, when you and I had spoken about this case back in the fall, one of the issues that we'd kind of talked about is why isn't there any classified information referenced in the indictment? What does that tell us, uh, perhaps, that DOJ is trying to steer clear of that? And looking at the docket now, it seems like there has been some of this material floating around. You can see on the docket entries, there have been all these SIPA um, hearings that are listed. There are lots and lots of documents that are listed as being filed under seal with no more information. But uh, there, there is one order from the judge essentially saying that there's some uh, SIPA material that he's decided should not be introduced. And so we're not concerned about that. That concerns what seems to be some kind of a cable from the State Department. But we haven't really seen any evidence of any of this material actually making its way into the trial so far. So, Dan, I don't want to ask you to, you know, speculate on on stuff that we don't know anything about, but just given the sort of contours of the case, the fact that it involves, you know, foreign affairs, what kinds of things would you expect might be at issue here? Yeah, the case not only involves foreign affairs, but at least as alleged in the indictment, it involves uh, Egyptian intelligence officials. And 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 frankly, if if our intelligence services aren't monitoring what the Egyptian intelligence services are doing, I want my money back because that that's their job. So the idea that there are that there are intercepts involving, at the very least, Egyptian officials discussing something about relating to this case seems to me highly likely. So where do you go from there? I suspect, and here I'm just speculating on the basis of absence, I suspect the government has made a real effort to not base its case on those intercepts. I suspect that to the extent there is SEPA activity, as you suggest, it's more likely to be relating to disclosures the government made as part of its Brady obligations, broadly understood that they felt required them to disclose classified information or or something connected to classified information. And that's what the litigation is about. But as you suggest, I got no idea. And 
I can only guess that the government wouldn't want to bring a case that's, that's both because it's hard as a matter of proof and it's complicated politically that that rested on intelligence intercepts by the United States. So they're moving forward and it's just this disclosure piece that might be generating some of the, the back and forth that we see traces of in the in the motion practice. Well, there is a ton that we have not even touched on in this case. We didn't even talk about uh, Menendez throwing his wife under the bus while she is undergoing treatment for cancer. Um, we could have gone on and on about the gold bars, but we did not. Uh, but the trial is still ongoing. So who knows, listeners, maybe we'll be back to you soon. Dan and Eric, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Quinta. Thanks, Molly. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Briggings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare Podcasts by becoming a Lawfare Material supporter through our website, lawfaremedia.org slash support. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. And check out our written work at lawfaremedia.org. The podcast is edited by Jen Pacha, and your audio engineer this episode was Noah Mosband of Goat Rodeo. Our theme song is from Alibi Music. As always, thanks for listening.